So uh, the, the Wii U confirmed that the buildings is the main should be the main priority. It's very really good for our program at the IEA. And before I start my presentation, maybe my first slides uh, might be boring for Brussels uh, audience, uh, but just to set the scene and to, rem to remind you that the IEA, the main purpose of the IEA is energy security. So all our analysis are based on how to ensure uh, energy security for our countries. And when we look at the EU, um, so uh, we have an increase in the energy consumption in the EU, and this increase, if you look at it, the, it's mainly uh, the, the building sector is responsible of this increase. We have decrease in the industry, but uh, the, the, the increase in the building sector is growing, and we expect, as Laura showed, to have uh, more increase. Uh, we, we don't expect to have a uh, decrease that will, uh, with the current policies, that will make the shift that we need to make uh, at the EU level. And when we look at more carefully uh, from energy security perspective, so all our member states are energy, almost all our member states are energy importers, and some of them are really energy dependent. Uh, uh, and I will come back to um, where we import our, in, uh, from where do we import our energy. And most of this import er, is oil and gas. And I insist on gas because gas is playing a major role in the building sector in the EU. And then most important is that how this import impact our, uh, our trade balance. And in, all, in overall the EU, the trade balance uh, due the impact of the energy uh, import on the trade balance is very bad. And we see that even in countries like Germany, where the trade balance is positive, the impact of the energy imports represent almost half, uh, can represent almost half. And in country like France, if we didn't have to import all this energy, and this is a total energy import, so the France energy, France will be in better situation and maybe will not be downgraded by uh, the market agencies. Uh, who knows? Uh, and <laughs> uh, I'm hoping not because I'm French. Uh, <laughs> So the situation varies from one country to another, but we see that overall for the EU27, uh, the impact of the energy uh, import is very important on the overall uh, trade balance of the EU. And when we look at more carefully from energy security perspective, from where this gas is coming, so we have Western part of the EU supplied be with European gas, and then we have Eastern part supplied with Russian gas, and then we have other part of the EU and we have some southern European uh, countries supplied with gas from MENA countries. Uh, and uh, this is why in the EU countries uh, we need to work uh, very hard to reduce the need to import this, uh, this gas. And when we look at more precisely for the building sector, 38% of the total uh, gas cons consumption in the EU uh, 27 uh, is, uh, is due to the building sector, and this figure doesn't include uh, the use of gas to produce uh, electricity. It's only the direct consumption of the gas in the building sector. Uh, so it's very, uh, it's very high. And then uh, electricity consumption is going up in the EU27, mainly in the non-residential sector, more than in the residential sector, uh, and it's 59% of the total electricity consumption in the EU. And uh, when we look at more uh, in details the consumption in the residential sector, so we, we all know that it's mainly the space heating. And I will come back later why I use this, uh, this graph. Um, and the rest is uh, uh, appliances. Appliances and uh, equipment are consuming. Appliances and equipment are consuming between 15 to 35 percent uh, in uh, different EU countries. And we know that we have we had during several years uh, focus on uh, policies for appliances, and we didn't focus enough on reducing the need to consume energy. And this is where the building regulations and EPPD and other regulations regulations play a role. Uh, now, this is the energy situation in the EU. Now, from policy perspective, uh, as European, when I am making presentation to the IEA delegates, I am always proud to say that we have comprehensive uh, policy uh, framework. But then when we go to the details, it's another story. So <laughs> now that we have the energy efficiency directive, it's the first time the EU is the only part of the world where we have in the regulation mandatory renovation rate. 
but unfortunately, it's just for 3% of the buildings owned and occupied by central government, which is nothing. We don't know the exact figures, but we don't expect that this will make the shift that we need to make in the EU. And in addition to that, we introduced for several reasons, we introduced the concept of deep renovation. It's the only regulation in the world that I know so far where the concept of deep renovation is introduced, which is good. And fortunately, we added the word staged deep renovation. I don't know what's that, there is no definition, and I hope that we will have definition that will lead us to deep renovation. Then, we have the Energy Performance Directive, we had the recast in 2010, again, we are the only part of the world where we have uh, this kind of directive, and the directive introduced in two, two, 2002, uh, mandatory, uh, mandatory minimum energy performance for existing buildings, it was great, except that we added the word when they undergo major renovation. And major renovation is defined, we have two options, and one of them is uh, if the cost is uh, uh, less than 25% of the value of the building. Really, in Paris, you will never have this. So you, never, you don't have to do it. You don't have to go to major renovation. And then we have lack of compliance. We don't check compliance. It's not the compliance to the directive that I'm talking about. It's what is happening in the field. In all IEA countries and in EU countries, we have been during the last two years trying to, uh, to uh, gather the data about compliance. They don't exist. And my conclusion is that if data don't exist, so we don't know, we are not doing it. Um, and then we have for uh, appliances and equipment, we have the eco-design directive. Uh, for appliances and equipment, we have to be fair to the US. They have been better than the Europeans in the past. Um, so they have more products that are regulated. But let's stay with the EU. We have the Eco Design Directive. And fortunately, the Eco Design Directive is still, uh, uh, it's not, uh, it's component approach and it's not system approach. And our main consumption in the EU, as I showed before, is due to heating systems. And the heating systems, we cannot tackle them by uh, looking to them uh, product by product. We are not getting the savings. And in most cases, we are looking the savings. And uh, for different reasons that we all know in this room, uh, boilers are not yet regulated. And just remember that heating is the main problem for the EU. And then, again, we don't have market surveillance in the EU. Just be, we are all European, just ch 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 say the truth. We don't know what's going on. And uh, the products are, that are put in the market, uh, we, have, we had some few experiences where we check a little bit. We have done some market surveillance, and the results are very bad. And then we have cost optimal methodology. Again, uh, we are the first part of the world where we introduced this idea to make the calculation based on long term for buildings when we, under, uh, when we have uh, renovation. And fortunately, again, uh, we don't have the societal perspective and we introduced this. We don't know exactly how it's going to be implemented, but we introduced again uh, this uh, to the option to have between 2 to 4% of discount rate. And we made some sen sensitivity analysis. So basically by moving from 2 to 4%, you lose after 40 years something like 50% of the savings. We need to refine a little bit our analysis, but uh, these are, so the cost of the methodology is not going, it's going to be again another tool to lock our savings potential, I think. And then we have several incentive schemes. I will go to this one. So this is what I have been able to gather from different sources and mainly the commission sources. So we have all these, these funding sources. And then we have uh, all these funding sources. We can have the information about uh, w which part is going to energy efficiency. But then when you try to understand which part is going to buildings, it's another story and you cannot get it. And when you try to understand uh, um, how this money is used, it's almost impossible in all EU and all IEA countries as well, so we are not doing well. But we have been able to do this exercise, now we can do it for all uh, IEA countries. So when you look at the savings, look at the red ones. The red ones are all the incentives where they are uh, related to buildings, but you don't have any energy requirements there. I don't know how, why we are giving these incentives, but we are giving, we are throwing out money for <coughs> buildings for energy efficiency without requirement. No way. I don't know how we can monitor that. I don't know how we can say that we are getting the savings. And then we have, um, in some, uh, we are making progress, little progress, in 
putting in including energy requirements. I, I, I wasn't able, you're not able yet to represent that, but even when we include energy requirements, they are so weak that it's just, we, we don't have to do that. We are, they are so weak and the market is doing better. We, we don't need to do that. So basically, in French, we say, on va droit dans le mur. So we are just going uh, towards the wall. And um, when we uh, look at from energy consumption at the households, at the, um, the residential sector, so we can see that between 1990 and 2009, we have a decrease in most countries except uh, Greece and, uh, Port and Spain, except the southern uh, countries. Uh, we have a decrease in the consumption. But be careful, these figures include the existing buildings and the new ones. I'm not yet able to split this and to look at only the existing ones. So we might be satisfied with that, but this is where we should be. This is where low energy buildings should be. So we are still far away in all our countries, even in the best ones, we are still far away when we look at the overall stock. So to answer your question, are we on track? The answer is of course no. And uh, now when we look at this from a uh, consumer's perspective, we look at the expenditures in the residential sector mainly. So what we see is that uh, the figures that you have, 1.1 for example, is uh, the monthly medium income uh, per person in the EU, in each country. So for example, if you look at uh, Portugal, if you are living in Portugal and you are living alone, you will spend 1.4 uh, of uh, one month, uh, almost one month and a half of your salary for your energy expenditures. Uh, this varies from one country to another, but you see that it's quite high. And uh, if you look at, I think it was the Slovak Republic, it's 1.8. Uh, so it's just not sustainable for, uh, for our countries. And uh, we know that we, we were facing uh, a fuel poverty in our countries. And this, we have an increase of the fuel poverty with the economic crisis. And we, pro we will probably have a more increase of, of people facing fuel poverty in the future. Uh, we just have to be careful. The Irish data are from 2005. The French and the UK data are from 2010. And um, we, uh, we know that uh, we, it's one of the issues that our governments need to address uh, very quickly, and the way to address it is to reduce the energy needs in the building sector. Now, uh, based on all this, we think that we haven't doing, we were not doing things in the right way. And I think it's really time, especially in the EU, for paradigm shift. We need to think the building sector differently. It's not uh, sustainable what we have been doing so far, and we should stop looking to the buildings, building by building. We should, from governmental perspective, look at the overall building stock and look at our uh, energy and carbon uh, reduction uh, target. And uh, in our recommendations last year, when we made the update, we included that the renovation should be mandatory. And it, it was based on the fact that we analyzed uh, in different IEA countries uh, how many buildings are renovated. So in some countries, you have uh, some uh, important figures. But then when you analyze more in depth how many countries are renovated from energy perspective, and then you go very, very, it's almost zero in most countries. And especially if it's good renovation or what we call deep renovation. And we need uh, all this, uh, what I showed you before, all these incentives, all this money that we are spending, just coming from different channels, it's not coordinated, and sometimes we have con co contradictions, and only few is going to renovation to really uh, reduce the energy needs. So what we propose is one-stop shop, because as citizens, we will never be able to manage uh, to go to different places to just to renovate our buildings. First, first we need to make uh, renovation mandatory. If, if we, we need to stop negotiating our future, our security. So this is, and to, uh, do, by doing that, this means that we need to make renovation mandatory and not only for 3% of central governmental occupied buildings. And uh, the one-stop shop could be in the EU, the local energy agencies that we already have. Uh, the, situa the European situation is much better than, for example, the US. We, we don't know yet uh, what we should propose for the one-stop shop for the whole US. But the EU could be the, the, the local energy agencies. The local energy agencies will be the only contact with the property. And we need to link this to the property because it's about buildings, it's not about people. And uh, it's about the consumption of these buildings. And um, in the 
past, we were used, most of our, our financial schemes are related usually to ESCOs and related to uh, companies looking for short payback uh, period investments. And this locks the savings potential. To get out of locking the savings potential, we think that we need cluster of companies together and the one-stop shop will select, will uh, um, uh, publish the tender and select the cluster of companies and to make sure that there is no uh, conflict of interest and to make sure that the target of this one-stop shop, it, it should be a governmental body, uh, will, will be to reduce, uh, to have this long-term view to reduce the energy uh, needs. And then we need technical expertise to make sure that the cluster of companies are doing uh, the work in the right way. And um, the contract will be between the cluster of companies and th the property, and they will be paid back by the energy savings. And to make all these things running, we don't, I think we should stop incentivizing locking the savings potential. What we need to do is to have a market framework that will allow this system to work. It sh we should look at to energy savings, especially in the building sector, like we look at to education and health. We don't incentivize hospitals for our health. We don't incentivize schools for our, uh, for our education. We, it's part of the investment that we need to do as a society. And to do that, in this case, we think that we, uh, the loan should be between the, the commercial banks that we have and the cluster of companies and um, we to, rem to remove or to reduce the perceived risk in the private sector, we need to have a guarantee fund. The guarantee fund, in the case of the EU, could be funded by all these sources of funding that we saw before. We need to see how to do that. And the guarantee fund will also fund the one-stop shop to build the capacity that we need. The two main issues that we have is that we need to build this capacity with the one-stop shop. It's not going to be easy. And the way we implement this, we think this could be implemented in all EU countries, easier to implement in EU countries than any other IEA country. The way to implement that will vary from one country to another based on uh, the economic and the, poli the national uh, context. Uh, but we do believe that if we continue like we are doing, incentivizing locking our savings potential, uh, we will never get there. And to be able uh, to, uh, to quantify this, how much money do we need and how much savings we will get, so we have a new model that uh, estimates that look at to the renovation of the building sector, not uh, in terms of uh, um, building by building only, but in terms of societal and economic, look at the last part, the, uh, the, 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 one, the last one, uh, in terms of uh, societal and economic benefits. So we, don't, we look at it in terms of economic activity that the whole system will generate. And by this economic activity, uh, we have, uh, we, we can make the system running. We are doing this for 15 countries, uh, 15 IA countries, six of them are EU countries. And uh, we started calibrating uh, this model uh, for France because they are going to have their energy debate soon. And uh, they are providing us input. Um, if you have any comment, any feedback on this chart, how to make it work, in different EU countries, uh, it's more than welcome. And if you would like to know more about our building program, I invite you to connect to our website. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you think that the uh, energy agencies could be the salvation of Europe. Now, um, <laughs> in the Netherlands, we have 1.5 energy agencies on a local level. And I know that we're doing quite well, European-wise. Um, how do you really expect that this is going to happen? And the second question, I'm totally missing cooling in your whole building story. And you just have to go to the south of Europe and see how energy use is increasing there. Could you go into both? Mm. Do I answer now? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. We have a uh, similar experience uh, um, in France, for example, with different local energy agencies. And in Paris, for example, what they have done is that they put all these agencies together under l'Agence Parisienne du Climat. And it's l'Agence Parisienne du Climat who is now in charge of, who is playing this role of one-stop shop, but they don't have the, o the overall picture. So they are playing this role, but in the, um, they are still in the, 
old fashion thinking uh, of energy approach. So uh, I think this is where we need to go. But of course, we need to adapt to the national context. I cannot know the exact, uh, cannot know the exact answer for each country. Uh, the cooling part, uh, in the graph where I showed uh, that there is a decrease uh, in the energy consumption in most EU countries, and then they said we cannot be satisfied with that. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that we have an increase in uh, the southern European countries, and it's due to mainly to cooling. So I didn't mention cooling for a very simple reason. We don't have data on cooling actually. But I, uh, I, I fully agree with you. It's uh, something that we need to consider very carefully, uh, especially in the uh, southern part of Europe, but not only, uh, because with the climate change, uh, so we need to make projections about how uh, the climate will impact the cooling demand, even in countries like France and Germany, uh, and maybe Nordic countries as well. Edwards from Housing Europe. Uh, first, quickly to say that this model looks really, really impressive. Um, we work for housing companies, housing, um, providing affordable housing, and this idea of taking the risk away from the, the building owners and the building residents via a national regional fund looks fantastic. Um, it looks like you're going to need some buy-in from European institutions. I wonder if, you've, if you already get a feeling from the European Investment Bank if they're going to be on board on, on this um, strategy. I, uh, we started discussions at national level, and uh, again, I'm sorry, I come back again to the French case study because the, of their energy debate. So we are discussing with Lacaste de Depot, and we have the buy-in from Lacaste de Depot, and we have the buy-in uh, from uh, the French ministry. But how, how to put this in place is, is another story, of course. Uh, but we are hoping to, uh, to have similar discussions with uh, the EU uh, uh, financial uh, institutions.